Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. Everybody come on in. We are looking forward to a great morning and we're so glad that you're here with us for worship this morning. It's a great day at First Baptist Church and it's just so good to see everyone's faces. We always love seeing new faces. We're so thankful for our, our guests that are here with us today. Thank you so much for joining in with us for, for worship this morning. We'd love for you to stop by the welcome desk before you leave this morning and get a bag and just uh, thank you for, to you for coming. Also, if you want to text welcome to the number you see on the screen, we can get some more information to you that way as well. Just to let you know, a few things coming up. One, we are excited for our Discover class that's coming up on February the 18th. Maybe you've been visiting First Baptist Church for a while and you're like, how do I join First Baptist Church? Or maybe you've just started coming and you're like, I love it. This is where God's calling me. Um, or I'm thinking about this might be the right place. Discover class is a great place for you to come. We answer questions. We let you little, know you a little bit about who we are in a little more detail and give you an opportunity to join First Baptist Church through that as well. It's easy to, to get signed up for Discover class. All you have to do is, if you picked up the notes when you came in this morning, if you look in the back here, there's a Discover class ad back here. There's a little QR code. Just scan that, and that will take you directly to the registration, and you can get signed up there. Um, also, we have coming up in a few weeks, we have uh, two different weekends for a family retreat. One of them's full, but March 1st to the 3rd, we have about two or three spots left. We would love for, uh, for you to join us in that, so you can go sign up through that. You can look at our church app or through the website and get signed up for a family retreat there. Also, we have coming up um, for too long, our March for Water, that's a uh, going to help us in awareness that not everybody can just go to the tap and turn water on and have fresh water, that there's people all around the world that, that, that have to really work for that and that isn't really available for them. And, and that gives us an opportunity to go in to countries and um, into communities and provide water. It also gives us the opportunity to talk about the, the living water. And it's a great ministry. And we're going to do, be doing an event here called the, the March for Water. And we're going to have some more details coming up about that in the weeks ahead. So be looking for that and see how you can be involved with that and help to be a champion for that in, in our community. Also, you may be thinking, like, how do I keep up with all this stuff going on at First Baptist Church? How do I know what's going on? I, I can't keep up with all this stuff. Well, hopefully you get our newsletter that goes out every week. It's an e newsletter it comes to your email. If you don't get that and you want to get that, stop by the welcome desk before you leave today. Give us your, your email address, your name, and we'll get you added to that. That way you can get all these important announcements and the links where to click into all that and keep you up to date. Also, did anybody notice anything different in the lobby today? Anybody know? Somebody saw some bottles? There were some bottles out there, some baby bottles out there in the lobby. Well, maybe you're wondering, what are those here for? What, am I supposed to take those home? I don't have a little kid. What do I need to do with those? Well, we've asked from the Hope Clinic, we've asked Jeanette uh, Harvey to come up, and she's going to tell us a little bit about why in the world we have baby bottles out there and, and what that means. So I'm Jeanette Harvey. I'm with the Hope Women's Resource Clinic. We are a crisis pregnancy center in Beaumont, but we bring our 38-foot mobile unit to Orange every Wednesday. We're parked in the parking lot by uh, the Old Baptist Hospital to serve the people of, of Orange County. We provide medical services, education, and material resources to women and men until their babies turn one. So last year we had over 41 visits to the Hope Clinic. That includes the mobile unit. 4,100. Did I say 100 the first time? Because 41 was not impressive, was it? You were like, why did they give her time? 4,100. Almost 800 of those were men because we're helping men to be the godly men and fathers that God created them to be. In that, uh, we have seen an explosion of women in need because of the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which is quite frankly one of the greatest miracles of our time. <laughs> Abortion became illegal, which meant a lot more women were going to be providing um, resources for their babies. They were having babies they didn't expect to have. And so we have just exploded with needs. The other side of that coin is the other side has decided that they were going to make abortion more available by just making it online where you can order a pill. And so our medical services were even greater needed. 
And so through all of that, um, the Lord has seen fit to move us in the direction of building a, a larger parenting center to provide more resources, to build a clinic in Port Arthur to provide us uh, additional space to meet women in that area, and to build a homeless shelter to house women who find themselves homeless because they're pregnant to help them get back on their feet. So I'm tired just talking about it. You can imagine if you're a part of all of this, right, how tired you are every day. So I need your help. And here's what I need you to do. I need you to pick up a bottle off of the table back there, fill it up with coins. Really, dollar bills is what I want. Coins are great, but they're heavy. They don't add up to as much money as if you stuff that thing with 10s or 20s. That's really going to meet the need. But even easier than that, just write a check. Lots of numbers fit on one line, and you're one and done. You can do it today and not have to think about it again. Uh, and I know it's sort of, you know, not really copacetic to get up on stage of a church and talk about money, but it all belongs to him. And I'm asking you to not take from your church, but to give sacrificially to what we're doing. The other thing I need from you is prayer. We have several ways that you can be praying for the women, and men of our clinic, several ways you can be pay playing for the staff and volunteers. And you can come back to that table and pick up a brochure and we'll walk you through all of that. And then I need volunteers. I need people who can do things like sweep and wash clothes. Uh, people who can hold babies because we got a lot of babies coming through there. We need all of that. My greatest need right now, though, is nurses. We need nurses, paid nurses. I'm going to sell you here. We don't pay a lot, and we have no benefits. However, you get to share the gospel with everybody, and you see people come to Christ. Last year, we led 109 men and women to Christ, which is amazing in my book. So if you're a nurse, come and talk to me at that table. I'll tell you exactly how to apply, and we have all kinds of hours, full-time, part-time, half-time, you name it. We can make it happen. We just can't pay you a lot. But the benefits are, as we would say, out of this world, and that's that you are answering the call on your life from the Lord himself to serve his people. So thank you all so much for the time, and hopefully you'll come talk to me at the table. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you, Hope Center, for all that you do and all you've done through the years to benefit families. We are glad. We're so glad that you've come to join us in worship today. <clears throat> you know, the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And he, he, he makes himself at home. He inhabits. He lives and he makes himself at home in the praises of his people. Sadly, I think sometimes we think that God inhabits the, the complaining of his people. Our God inhabits the whining of his people, but God inhabits the praises. So with that in mind, would you just, with everything that you have today, would you just stand to your feet? Would you not only sing those words, but would you ingest those words? And would you give them back as an offering of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord today? Would you do that? Let's worship.
stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. place uh there are those who just you you're just standing there to in the in, in your in your aisle and you're saying god that's what i need i need god to make a way for me i need that i need that miracle worker i need that promise keeper i need that i need that one who will do all those things in me because right now my life just doesn't make sense my life is a wreck or my life is going in 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 a in a completely opposite direction that i think that it should go I just want to I just want to pray for you. I just want to hold you up today before the Lord and just say, God, here they are. Here we are. God, would you come and would you be that way maker? Would you be that promise keeper that, that we sing about and that we know about from your word? So God, I come today. Lord, I come on behalf of of, of those of us who are in the family today, the, the family of believers, and that somehow maybe we thought when when you would come into our heart, God, that everything would be smooth sailing and everything all, uh, ev everything would just go just our way. And God, the, the reality is uh, that just isn't the way life is. But God, I pray for those who are, who are just needing to know that you are the promise keeper. You are the one who makes the way in the wilderness. You are the one who heals in the sickness. You are the one who provides when, when times are lean. God, that you are that. And you are that in, in, in each and every life. God, today I pray that our faith and our trust would be in you. Lord, today that we would, uh, we would, we would deny what the world might say as uh, there are many ways to God. And when we, when we know in reality and in truth by your word that Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. God, we celebrate you today. Lord, as a part of our celebration is just confessing that we need you. We need you more than anything. God, we do love you and we thank you. It's your beautiful, awesome, and mag majestic name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, church. Now, you're at a little bit of a disadvantage this morning. In the first service, we got to have a, a mother-daughter baptism, and it was such a, such a sweet, sweet moment. And so we just wanted to make sure that you could celebrate that with us as well, even though you weren't here per perhaps for, for first service. Uh, let me also tell you this. Thank you so much for putting up with my sick self last week. I'm glad to be here and well this week. And I'm just excited to be able to jump into God's Word together this morning. Wasn't it a great time of worship this morning as well? And so we're blessed to be able to come and worship and have such incredible uh, vocalists and musicians to be able to lead us in worship. Now, when I was a young boy, uh, my mom would pray with me when she, when she put me to bed. And I was an only child, and so I got all that, all that attention. And I can remember, you know, in the deep recesses of my memory, some of those nights where she would tuck me in, and we would do these sing-songy kind of prayers because she wanted me to learn at an early age that prayer is important. Now, the, the first prayer she taught me, the first prayer I learned, I was probably maybe younger, but the, really the first memories I have was around the age of three or four. And it was the prayer, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray, dear Lord, my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray, dear Lord, my soul to take. But for an incredible amount of time, part of that prayer did not make sense to me. And after months or, or, or maybe years, I'm not sure, I went to my mom and I said, Mom, what is an aphasidae? She's like, what are you, what are you talking about? An aphasidae, you say it every night, what's an aphasidae? She's like, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, uh, aphasidae, before I wake, I pray to your Lord my soul to take. And, and she was like, no, Josh, it's not aphasidae. So for like three years, I've been praying, a fast die, God. And she's like, no, if, it's, if I should die. Well, that was even worse, right? I'm like, Mom, I'm three years old here, and we're talking about dying. Now, when it comes to prayer, it helps if you understand the words you're praying, does it not? And, in, you know, sometimes when it comes to prayer, we've got a lot of thoughts that sort of swirl around our head. You know, sometimes... And no fault of their own, perhaps they grew up and that's how they learned to pray. It was just these certain repetitious prayers. Some people learn prayers in Latin, which sounds beautiful. But if you don't know the meaning of the words, then the prayer ends up being somewhat hollow and, and somewhat empty. Sometimes we might feel like our prayers aren't as good as other people's prayers. Uh, you know, sometimes you hear somebody pray and you're just like, wow, that was poetic. Wow, that was good. I, I can't pray like that. Uh, some people feel uncomfortable praying in public, I understand. Um, some people perhaps wonder, well, if God already knows what's going to happen, why am I even praying in the first place? Uh, for, for some people, they might feel like their prayer is redundant, that they pray the same thing over and over and over. Perhaps some people even feel like that maybe they're angry with God because they've been praying and, and, and it seems that God isn't answering. You know, there's a lot of things that swirl around our heads when it comes to to prayer. And I think sometimes maybe we have questions about prayer. And apparently we're not the only ones that could use instruction here because, <coughs> excuse me, as we get into our story today in Luke 11, we see that Jesus' disciples, they come to him with this request of, of God, of Lord, would you, would you teach us to pray? And so together we've been in this journey through the book of Luke from the cradle to the cross. And, and we've been looking at portions of Jesus' life and portions of his ministry. And, and we've seen the, the promise of his coming. We've seen his humble beginning, his birth in a stable and a backwater town to a, a, a nobody mom. And uh, his, his stepfather, Joseph, was just a, just a general normal guy, a carpenter. We, we've seen him uh, be baptized by uh, John the Baptist, and we saw Jesus be tempted in the wilderness, and we saw John prepare the way, and we've seen John's life come to an end, and we, we saw Jesus call his disciples, and along the way we've run into topics like faith and doubt, and we know as Christians that we, we want to have strong faith, but then there's moments where we have some doubt too, and last week we talked about who, who is Jesus and what does it mean to, to be a disciple and to take up your cross and, and follow the Lord. 
And so today, as, we, as we're working through Luke, we'll be in Luke chapter 11. We're going to start off in verse 1. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to join me there, Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, I sometimes get asked, what do, you, what do you read out of? What version? I read of an English Standard Version, if you're, if you're curious. Uh, I like an English Standard Version because it's sort of uh, easy language, but also does a really good job of capturing the original language and the original meaning. There's many good translations. That's just the one that I read out of. And so this morning, we're going to talk for a few minutes about prayer and hopefully move past that of fascia die into a deeper and more vibrant prayer life, getting some instruction from Jesus himself. And so Luke 11, verse 1, it starts off here. It says, now Jesus was praying in a certain place. Now, if you remember last week when we started our time together, Jesus was doing the exact same thing. He was praying, then he goes to his disciples and says, who do people say that I am? Today we find that Jesus is praying, and then afterwards his disciples come to him and say, would you teach us how to pray? But my point is, all throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus continually talking to the Father. And we we said last week, we'll say it again this week, if Jesus valued prayer and saw its place, then certainly we must also be willing to see just the importance of prayer in our lives and that things might look different if as Christians we took this call to the discipline of prayer seriously. And you say, well, why do you call it a discipline? Because it is a discipline. It's just like anything else for it to show up in your life consistently. It's something that we have to be disciplined to do. Like it doesn't always come naturally, but then sometimes it just flows out of us. Sometimes in trickles and sometimes in this huge, huge current. Luke 11, verse 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Now, to some degree, this text is a bit surprising because these men are Orthodox Jews, and the Old Testament places such an importance on prayer. However, as, as we tend to do, we tend to mess things up. And so the religious elite, the religious leaders, they had turned prayer into more of showmanship that actually what Jesus is fixing to walk us through here is as we look at um, how he instructs us to pray. Now, before we get to Jesus, the content of Jesus' prayer, there's a few things I want to talk about. First of all, I want you to see that um, what he doesn't focus on. He doesn't focus on posture. You know, you can pray standing up. You can pray kneeling down. You can pray laying in your bed at night. He doesn't focus on location. Now, in Matthew 6, he does talk about going to a private place, going, he says, go into your closet. And the idea there is that prayer isn't meant to be a public spectacle. Can you pray in public? Absolutely. But there's this heart and this intentionality that's supposed to be there. So you can pray anywhere. It doesn't matter. It's not meant to be showy. You can pray driving down the road. You can pray in a box. You can pray with a fox. You can pray on a walk or in church or on a mountain. It doesn't matter. Jesus says you can pray anywhere. He doesn't focus on a time. Uh, You can pray in the morning when you first rise. You can pray in the evening when you lie down. You can pray all day in between. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Neither does Jesus talk about the attitude here. Um, You know, sometimes I think we think maybe I have to be in a good attitude to approach the Lord. That is, you know, things have to be well within me. But the truth of the matter is, often the reason I need to pray is because my attitude is not great. That, that I come not in the right frame of mind. And then I talk to God and something happens in that prayer. Now, if you're taking notes this morning, the first thing I want you to see is, is what prayer is not. What prayer is not, before we get to Jesus says pray this way. First of all, note that prayer isn't repetitious words. You know, uh, it, it's great when you're three or four to learn a prayer and the importance of it and there's some sing-songiness and there's some repetition. But at some point, we've got to move past a fascia die, right? We, we've got to get to this place where prayer becomes something just conversational between us and God. And so it's not, you know, prayers that we memorize, so there's nothing wrong with memorizing prayers, but there's something that should be heartfelt. So it's not just a repetition. Neither is prayer a formula, of, well, you know, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this, and say this, and I'm going to say it right, and I'm going to say it well, and because I've said this, this, and this, that unlocks the secret. That unlocks the secret for God to answer my prayer. Prayer isn't a formula where we can manipulate God and, 
and, you know, get him to move and give us what we want. Neither is prayer, and this is a big one because I'm guilty here sometimes, church. Prayer is not simply a way to get what we want. Well, God, I want this, and I need this, and, you know, we approach God almost like this, this gigantic vending machine of, I'll have this, and I'll have this, and I really, really need this, God, and if you could do this on my timeline, that would be great, and I want, I want, I need, I need. Now, a portion of our prayer, sh- as we'll see, is attending to the needs that we have, um, but prayer isn't simply a way to get what we want, and I think often we sort of approach God in this, in this manner. So, Maybe you're here this morning, and you say, well, point number two, if you're following along with the outline, well, what's the point? I I struggle to understand what's the point. Why pray if God is in control? And I feel like we need to get this question out of the way, and and maybe you felt like this. Well, if God is in control, why do I pray? Well, I would say that's exactly why we do pray, because God is is in control and because God is sovereign and above and over all things. But I think still we wonder if what's going to happen is going to happen according to God's divine plan, then why do I pray? If we know that God doesn't change and God's mind doesn't change, then, then why do I pray? Now here's my thoughts. And I understand some people will will disagree, but what you get in Scripture is sometimes you get these tensions, God's control and and our free will, and how do we we keep this tension there and and do God's Word justice and and understand what the text says. And so not everyone will agree with me, and it's okay. I know some people don't mind being wrong, and and that's fine. Don't take yourself too seriously, right, church? Um, Here's here's my thoughts. (coughs) Why do we pray? What's, What's the point? Well, I believe God took our prayers into account in eternity past. What do I mean by that? I mean that due to God's foreknowledge, that before he decreed anything to happen, that he knew because of his divine foreknowledge when we would pray and when we wouldn't pray. How much we would pray, how little we would pray. And so because God is a unique being like no one else and has the ability with foreknowledge, to know everything we would pray, I think our prayers are important because God would have taken into consideration whether or not you prayed. And so I think we can interpret passages like those in James, you have not because you ask not. That is to say, God might have done something differently had you not prayed on this occasion or across this span of time. That's Josh Fultz thinking according to what we get in Scripture. But beyond that, there's other reasons we pray as well. One of those being that prayer is relational. You see, prayer is not about relaying information. God's not in heaven listening to you pray and say, well, I didn't know that. We better go back to the drawing board and figure, figure this out. Prayer is not about relaying information. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 8, your father knows what you need before you even ask. And again, you're back to that place. Well, God, if you know what I need, why do I need to ask? Because prayer is relational. When you pray, you are entering into a conversation with a person, with a person. Now, my wife already knows I love her. So I guess I don't need to tell her for the rest of our lives, right? Or or even worse, What if I never told my wife, thank you for doing that, because she already knows that I'm thankful for her? Or even worse, what if I never tell her I'm sorry when I mess up, because she already knows that I'm sorry? This is not how relationships work. We talk to God because God is our friend and our father and our confidant and our listener, and he's with us even when nobody else seems to listen, that God is attuned with us, and prayer just sort of spills out. Why else do we pray? Well, I believe we pray because prayer changes us. When we say, well, I I won't pray because it won't change the immediate situation, we miss out on the fact that prayer changes us in a mighty way. Let me share C.S. Lewis's words here. He says, he says, I pray because I can't help myself. He says, I pray because I'm helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. He says, it doesn't change God. He said, but it does change 
me. And often what needs to change in my life is me. Often I can't change my circumstances or my situation. But when I come to God in prayer, after that amen, I find that I am different. And I often find that when I spend time in prayer, when I unload my needs, when I put down my burdens, when I confess my sins, after the amen, something is different. And so we find all throughout God's word that as Christians, we are supposed to be praying people. Now, we get to Jesus' words. Thought number three, how to pray. Here's a guide for us. Now, now notice what Jesus isn't doing. He isn't saying, pray this prayer. He's telling us, this is how you pray. He gives us a template, a guide. Verse two, and he said to them, when you pray, say. Again, this is just a guide. He says, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Now, you notice it begins to a person. Again, it's, it's deeply relational. We are addressing our Father. Now, the word Father used here is an Aramaic word, Abba, which is most likely, if you were a little Jewish boy or girl, this is probably the first word you would ever learn to speak. And Jesus is pointing us to the idea that our Father is intimate with us. As a, as a two- or three-year-old child runs to their, their daddy and says, Father, Jesus says, this is whom we pray to. And he emphasizes our helplessness here and our need to connect with our Father. And he'll remind us that, that God is good to us, that he's not holding out on us, that your Father delights in giving you good things. Later in the text and in Matthew, he also says, you know, that if, a, if an earthly father likes to give their children stuff, how much more so does our heavenly Father like to answer our prayer, prayers and bless us? God is good to us. Philippians 4.19, And my God will supply every need of you, yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So Jesus says in verse 2, And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Well, what does that mean? It means to give God glory. This is one thing we didn't mention in, a minute ago, and, and why do we pray? We pray to give God glory. And while he is our friend and our confidant, he's also our God, and our Lord. And so we approach him as such that hallowed be your name. God is different. He's holy. He's beyond us. He is the only wise God, and this is who he has revealed himself to be. And so this is how we pray. And then he says, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. What does that mean? It means that we align with God's purposes. When we say your kingdom come, this is referring to God reigning in human hearts. This is a missional prayer. God, grow your kingdom. God, convict the lost. God, in us, create in us clean new hearts, this process of sanctification. So when we pray your kingdom come, we would ask that God would save sinners, that he would transform believers, and that he would return in his glory you know, Matthew's uh, gospel says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's us aligning our hearts with God's heart. Instead of prayer turning into us trying to get God to align his heart to our hearts. So prayer begins in heaven and it ends in heaven. And our attitude should be, God, create in me a desire for what you want. Jesus teaches to pray. Look at verse 3. He says, give us each day our daily bread. That is, we look, if you're taking notes, thought C is we look to God to meet our needs. There's, there's nothing wrong with asking God to meet our needs. And I'm, I'm going to let you know, sometimes I even ask him for wants as well. There's nothing wrong with that, but that shouldn't be the entirety of our prayer. I love my kids, but I would get annoyed quick if every time they came to me, it was always, Daddy, can I have? Daddy, I want. Daddy, can I have? Now, they do that some, but sometimes they come to me and they say other things. This, this past week, um, our middle child, Hadley, has been on a dad kick, which I love. And, and she came to me and she said, Dad, you're the best dad ever. Now, I know I am, in fact, not the best dad ever. But that was it. Nothing else. Didn't want anything else. Dad, you're just the best dad ever. Thanks, Hadley. The other night, she came to me and said, Dad, 
Don't tell her I told you this because I might get in trouble. But she said, Dad, I'm glad you're a pastor. She never says pastor. She always says pastor. Dad, I'm glad you're a pastor. I said, why is that? She said, because you teach us about God. And she sat there for a minute. And she said, well, even if you weren't a pastor, I bet you'd still teach us a lot about God because you sure love God. I said, that's right, Hadley. And so part of approaching our Father is asking him to meet our needs and some of our wants. But that shouldn't be all of it. But Jesus says, when you pray... Ask God, give us each day our daily bread. And we see here, we see this transition from focusing on God and his fatherly nature and that we should pray and give him glory and align our needs, to, to our, our wants to his wants. But now you see a shift in our, our humanity here in this prayer. You see, we are needy people. We're needy creatures, and you may not feel needy because you're an American, and as Americans, we are pretty blessed. We have a nice house and a bed and a car, and you may say, my house ain't that nice. I promise you this. If you go spend a week in a third world country, you will feel like you are living in paradise. We have it pretty good, but the fact is we're needy people. We need food, and we need water, and we need shelter, we need clothing, we need health care, and we need, uh, you know, uh, people to be around us. We need companionship. Let me remind you, this is what Jesus is saying. God cares about your needs. Now think this through. God is is working at a global level. He's working at a universal level. We know that all things are held together by Christ throughout the entire universe. That we could say God has a lot on his mind, except for the fact that he also is caring and attentive of every need you have have. How incredible is that? And, and maybe you're here this morning and, and, and you have some needs. And, and maybe you're here this morning and you're, you're fretting and, and you're worried and you're anxious. Can I remind you Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 33? Here, here's what he says. It's a famous sermon on out. He says, therefore I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? He says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Let that soak in. And which of you being anxious could even add a single hour to the span of his life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil or spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Therefore don't be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? The Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father, he already even knows that you need them. But instead seek God first and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added. Friend, God is not absent. God knows every need you have. And scripture says that he is a great provider. So take your needs and even some of your wants to him. But don't let that be entirely what our prayers are about. Jesus goes on. I want you to see that he reminds us that we are in prayer. Where there should be confession. There should be confession. Verse 4, he says, and forgive us our sins for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Now, forgive us our sins. Everyone is a sinner. We, we are not just occasional sinners. We sin frequently, and here's the truth. Sometimes, often, we sin deliberately. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. Sometimes we do that. What is sin? What's anything that displeases God or, or violates his commands? It's missing the mark. It's stepping over the line. Now, in this prayer, it seems to me that Jesus is referring to initial forgiveness of we come to God and we say, God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Give me a relationship with you. I want to make you Lord of my life. But beyond that, there's also this ongoing daily repentance that as Christians, we should pray because we fall short every day. And maybe you ask, well, if God has forgiven me when I was saved, and if God forgave me of my past sins, my present sins, and my future sins, then why do I need to go to him every day and say, God, forgive me for my sins and where I've fallen short today? Well, it's just like this. The, the, the one time, maybe two times a year that my wife does something that, that, that is damaging to our relationship and she sins against me, so to speak. In that moment, do we stop being married? Well, of course not. 
But she'll come and she'll say, Josh, I'm, I'm sorry I did that. Josh, I'm sorry I said that. And in that moment, we forgive one another and our, our relationship is brought back into harmony and closeness. Now, as a Christian, God has forgiven you past, present, and future sins, but we still sin. And that sin is covered by the blood of Christ, but I don't stop becoming a Christian. But I have to go to God and say, Father, forgive me. And sometimes it looks like this. I did it again, God. I did it again. And I, I'm sorry. And that relationship is brought back into harmony. But notice what Jesus says. He says in verse 4, And forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who has sinned against us. Now here's the point that Jesus wants us to know. That it's so easy for bitterness and anger and resentment and poison to get the stranglehold on our hearts. But Jesus is saying that people who ask for forgiveness are people that forgive other people. That forgiven people are forgivers. And here's the truth of the matter. If you're not right with your fellow man, your fellow believer, other Christians, or those that are lost, if you're not right with the people around you, you cannot be right with God. And you say, well, that's not true. Sorry, I respectfully disagree. It is true. You cannot be right with God relationally on a daily basis as long as we harbor animosity toward other people. Now think about it. Think about the depth and degree that God has forgiven us. Who are we to not forgive the people who wrong us? So we forgive and we ask God for forgiveness. Now notice, end of verse 4, we seek God's help. Forgive us our sins. Forgive everyone who's indebted to us. And Lord, lead us not into temptation. Well, what does that mean? That's a curious thing for Jesus to pray. Because we know this. James 1.13 tells us, Let no man say when he's tempted um, that I'm being tempted by God. God doesn't tip. So, so what do you mean, Jesus? Well, I think Jesus is saying a, a couple of things here that we can make application with. While God won't tempt, he will allow us or even sometimes lead us into trials and difficult seasons of our lives. And so I think part of what Jesus is saying is that when difficulty comes, Lord, ne let me not mess this up. Let me stay the course. Let me ride the trial out focused on you without walking into sin and temptation. But I think we could also say this, God, shield me. Help me make good decisions. Don't let me give in to evil and to temptation. We take our struggles and we take our temptations to God. Now, we're in and our, in, our time is nearly ending, but I, I want you to see what Jesus does here. And so he teaches them how to pray. And then he sort of moves into the story, this parable with the disciples. Now, we're not going to take a lot of time here, but I want you to notice something. I want you to see persistent prayer. Persistent prayer. Let's just read through this story. We'll make a quick application. Look at verse 5. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. Hospitality was a big deal in this culture. Verse 7, and he will answer from within, Don't bother me. The door is shut. My kids are in bed with me and I cannot give up, get up and give you anything. I tell you. So he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, his persistence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be open. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If then you who are evil, surprise, we're evil. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now what's going on in this story? Well, in the ancient world, sleeping arrangements were different. Usually families all slept in one room. Usually they had a big family. And so this neighbor shows up at this guy's house late at night, midnight, knock, knock, knock. I need some bread because I've got a guest here. And the dad in the house, the door is locked. He says, go home. My kids are sleeping. I'm going to have to tiptoe over all my kids just to get you some bread. Go home. 
But the guy is persistent. He keeps knocking and knocking, saying, I need some bread. And finally the dad says, well, if I don't get you a loaf of stinking bread, you're going to wake up everybody in the household anyway. So he sneaks out of bed, gets to the kitchen, tiptoes over the kids, unlocks the bolt, and gives the neighbor the bread. What is Jesus' point? The point is, even sometimes we may feel like our prayers aren't being answered. Keep praying. The word here for persistence or impudence means bold, shameless, and audacious. That as Christians, we can boldly come to our Father, not because of who we are, but because of who He is. It's like the whole thing when you're, kid, you know, you're a kid. My dad can do this. Your dad can't do this. We can approach our Father, our Abba, boldly. And even when it feels like our prayers are hitting the ceiling, you keep praying. Now notice what he says in verses 9 and 10. He says, I tell you, ask, it'll be given. Seek, you'll find. Knock, it will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And for the one who knocks, it will be opened. I want you to note, this is not a blank check. If we pray selfishly, God's not going to give you everything you want. However, when we pray selflessly, and our will aligns with God's will, this is a reminder that God does big things, and he answers prayers. Now, as we come to a close with our time together this morning, let me ask you, how's your prayer? How's your prayer life? Are you, are you talking to God? What if we, as a church, what if we all prayed consistently and vibrantly and we all wanted the same things that, that God wants and our hearts align? Might Orange Texas look different? Might our families look different? God align and shape our hearts. When was the last time when you were praying to God, you just went into a period of thanksgiving? God, thank you for your giving. Thank you for what you do for me. Thank you for what you do for my family. God, thank you for all the yeses. But God, also thank you for the noes too, because you know what I need. I don't always know what I need. So God, even when you give me those noes, thank you, because that's what's going to be best for me. What about sin? Is there any, consent, any sin in your life that you need to confess? Any, anything where you need to say, God, this has been a consistent pattern. God, I'm sorry. Or maybe you're here and you're not a believer and you need to come to know Christ. Or maybe you've just gotten out of the habit of confessing sin and things aren't well between you and God. Or perhaps there's someone you need to forgive. That you know you and God aren't going to be right until you and other people get right. Is there someone you need to forgive? Or maybe you are burdened and you're hurting and you're heartbroken and you're sad or you're just in a difficult season. Can I remind you to bring it to Abba, to bring it to the Lord? Maybe you've even stopped praying. Can I encourage you, just like this neighbor, boldness, audacity, persistence, we keep going to the throne, and we keep going to the throne. And it may be that God changes the situation and the circumstance, or it may be that he changes us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you once again, thankful to be in your house. Thankful that we can know you in an intimate way, Lord. That we can call you Father. That you're never distant from us that you never move away from us, God. God, we thank you that we can talk to you anytime, anywhere, any place, any posture. And Lord, we just continue to ask that you would align our hearts and our wills to you. Lord, would you use First Baptist Church Orange? Would you change us? Would you conform us into the image of your Son? Lord, we pray your kingdom come, your will be done in our midst. But God, we just want to give you glory and praise and honor. Lord, all throughout the day, all throughout the week, might um, our praises and prayers arise to you. God, we love you. We lift up your name. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus. It's in his sweet, holy, and precious name that we pray. Amen.